Hello, my dear friends in the UK and wherever you are listening. Welcome to this online meeting, which is on one of the wonderful psalms, the so-called Messianic Psalms. The topic is the glory of the Lord Jesus as shown in Psalm 8. And this psalm, as we might already know, speaks about the Lord Jesus being the Son of Man. This wonderful title that he has, Son of Man. Now we get this expression in verses 4 and 5, but in order to get the context, I would just like to read the whole psalm first of all. Psalm 8. Jehovah, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth, who hast set thy majesty above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings thou hast established praise, because of thine adversaries to still the enemy and the avenger. When I see the heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and stars which thou hast established, what is man, the feeble mortal man, that thou art mindful of him? And the son of man, which is Adam, that thou visitest him. Thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with glory and splendor. Thou hast made him to rule over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put everything under his feet, sheep and oxen, all of them, and also the beasts of the field, the fowl in the heavens and the fishes of the sea, whatever passeth through the paths of the seas. Jehovah our Lord, how excellent, <coughs> excuse me, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. This wonderful psalm psalm is really a messianic psalm. It speaks about the Lord Jesus. This psalm is quoted four times in the New Testament, and we will have a look later on to these reference, references, and these references make it very clear that this psalm speaks about the Messiah or Christ. Messiah is the Hebrew word, Christ is the Greek word, and the meaning of both Messiah and Christ is the Anointed One. And whenever we read Messianic Psalms, Psalms about Christ, we realize who He is and what He has done. Messianic Psalms make Christ great, and there are quite some Psalms who are particularly messianic because Christ is the very center. As far as I know, you have already considered Psalm 16. This is one of the great messianic psalms. Psalm 22, of course, which speaks of Christ hanging on the cross and being risen afterwards. We also have Psalm 2 that speaks about the Son of God, the King over Israel, and here we have Psalm 8, that great psalm concerning the Lord Jesus, Jesus being the Son of Man. And we will see two great things in this psalm. On the one hand, the humiliation of the Lord Jesus Christ, who humbled himself. God made him a little lower than the angels. That is one thing that we see. And on the other hand, we have the wonderful glory afterwards, the glory of the Son of Man who will be in the millennium the ruler over all the works of God's hand. Now, if we consider these messianic psalms, 
we see the glory of the person of Christ, who he is, but we do also see the greatness of what he has done, of what he is still doing, and of what he will be doing in a future day. The New Testament tells us that the prophets of the Old Testament, including the Psalms, the Messianic Psalms, that they speak about the sufferings of Christ and the glory here thereafter. The Lord Jesus himself said to the disciples who went to Emmaus in Luke 24, I would like to read this verse, Luke 24, verse 26, Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and enter into his glory. And Peter speaks about the prophets of the Old Testament, and in these prophets was the Holy Spirit. And we read the Spirit of God testifying before in the Old Testament of the sufferings which belong to Christ and the glories hereafter. So you have sufferings, humiliation, and you have glories afterwards. We see the humiliation of Christ. He had been made a little lower than the angels. That was 2,000 years ago when the Lord Jesus was here on earth. He was the true servant of God. He humbled himself. He was made a little lower than the angels, becoming man. But directly, we read afterwards, Thou hast crowned him with glory and with splendor, or with honor. After the Lord Jesus suffered, he rose again, he ascended into the glory, and there we see him crowned with that wonderful crown, that diadem that God gave him, a crown of pure gold, as we read in Psalm 21, for example. Now talking about this expression, the Son of Man. This tells us what the Lord Jesus is, or what he became. Of course, he always is the great God, the eternal God. But this great God, the Lord Jesus, the eternal Son of God, he became a true man. He humbled himself. He was born by a woman, truly the Son of Man. This is what we call the Incarnation. He became man. And we read from Hebrews chapter 2. I would like to read verse 7, where this psalm is quoted. Thou hast made him some little inferior to the angels. Thou hast crowned him with glory and honor, and hast set him over the works of thy hands. This is a quotation of Psalm 8. And then the writer of the letter to the Hebrews continues, But we see Jesus, who was made some little inferior to angels, on account of the sufferings of death, crowned with glory and honor, so that by the grace of God he should taste death for everything. Here you get the past, what happened 2,000 years ago, and at the same time you get what is future when the Lord Jesus will be set over all the works of God's hand. The Lord Jesus will accomplish what Adam should have accomplished, but he did never 
accomplished it. If we look into the history of creation in the book of Genesis, we read in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, <coughs> And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the heavens, and over the cattle, and over the whole earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth on the earth. That was Adam's task. But as of the beginning, he failed. But Christ does not fail. He could not fail, and he cannot fail. He will accomplish what Adam did not accomplish. He will rule over all that God had created. The Lord Jesus is, on the one hand, true man, born by a woman. And that is the one great thought we get when we consider this expression, the Son of Man. It is only referred to three times in the Old Testament. We will quote these verses later on. But, of course, in the New Testament you get this expression, Son of Man, quite often. In the Gospels, the Lord Jesus calls himself Son of Man. In the Acts of the Apostle, we read about the Son of Man at the right hand of God. Stephen, Acts 7, saw the Son of Man standing there. Then you get quotations of the Son of Man in the Epistles. For example, in the Epistle to the Hebrews. And again, you get this expression, in Revelation, the Son of Man. And if we consider the different passages where we find Son of Man, this expression, Son of Man, we realize that on the one hand it speaks about the true humanity, the true man, Jesus Christ, the Word who became flesh, and on the other hand, Son of Man is a title of glory connected to the Lord Jesus in his rule over all the works of God's hand. Not only over Israel, not only over the nations, but a general rule over all that God had, <coughs> had created in the beginning. The first quotation in the New Testament is Matthew chapter 8, and here you get the first aspect. Matthew 8, and Jesus says to them, The foxes have holes, and the birds of heaven roosting places. But the Son of Man has not where he may lay his head. You see, the humble man. He had nothing, not even a place where he could lay his head. The last quotation in the New Testament is found in Revelation 14. And here you get the other aspect. I read that verse, Revelation 14, verse 14. And I saw, and behold, a white cloud and on the cloud one sitting like the Son of Man, having upon his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. Now this is not a quotation from Psalm 8, but it refers to Psalm 8. Here we have the Son of Man with that golden crown, what we found in Verse 5 of our psalm, Thou hast crowned him with glory and splendor. Now, let us consider these two aspects a little more in detail. And we will realize 
how great the Lord Jesus is. And dear friends, it is always good and useful and blessed to contemplate the Lord Jesus. Be it the Lord Jesus as the true man on earth, the lowly man, or be it the Lord Jesus as the one who is called the King of kings and Lord of lords, who will one day rule over all that wonderful creation. It is necessary for us, it is the best food for our souls to consider the Lord Jesus. Now the first aspect, he is true man. The psalm starts to tell us about the greatness of the Lord and it ends with the greatness of the Lord. Jehovah, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. Verse 3, when I see the heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast established. And the last verse, Jehovah, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. You realize it's not just Jehovah, the everlasting, unchanging one, but it is Jehovah our Lord in verse 1 and also in verse 9. It is the Lord Jesus himself who comes before us in his greatness as the creator. We see his glory and his greatness in creation. But then this great creator, our Lord Jesus, who upholds everything by the word of his power and might, he became true man. He humbled himself. He was born by a woman born under the law. He was made a little lower than the angels. Now, this is a striking expression, isn't it? Lower than the angels. How is that possible, that the Lord Jesus was made a little lower than the angels? Now, of course, this has nothing to do with his personal glory. And this has nothing to do with his moral glory. When we consider the personal glory of the Lord Jesus, he always has the first place, the preeminence. When we consider his moral glory, he is always the first. But the Lord Jesus entered into a condition and into a position where he really was for a certain time when he was living on earth during these 33 years, lower, a little lower than the angels. Positionally, this is true. Angels are nearer to God than human beings. And the Lord Jesus, becoming a man, was made a little lower than the angels. Don't get me wrong, I have not said and I would never say the Lord Jesus was a creature. He was not created. He was never created. But he became true man. John tells us in his first, in the first chapter of his gospel, the word became flesh. That is the incarnation. The word became flesh. Flesh means man. And a human being, a man, consists of three, of three elements, if I might say so. You get that in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Our, ho our whole, your whole soul, spirit, and body might be preserved. 
spirit, soul and body. These are the three elements. You see, an animal, on the contrary, only has two of these elements, and that is a distinguishing mark. An, ele an, an animal is a living soul and has a body, but no spirit. But a man, a human being, has spirit, soul and body. And so had the Lord Jesus. He had a spirit, a human spirit. He had a soul and he had a body. The New Testament, the Gospels, give testimony of that. The Lord Jesus became man, as we are, but with one great difference. The Lord Jesus did not sin. The New Testament is very clear about this fact. He did no sins, that is what Peter said. He knew no sin, that is what the Apostle Paul says. And the third testimony is given by John. Sin is not in him. <coughs> no, the Lord Jesus is perfect man, as we are, perfect man, but no sin. He could not sin. He is the sinless, spotless, perfect man. When he came on earth, on earth, and we have already read that verse in the Gospel of Matthew, he became poor. So poor that he had not even a house, an apartment, a shed, not even a bed where to lay down his head. The Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians tells us, chapter 8, verse 9, for ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that for your sakes he, being rich, became poor, in order that ye by his poverty might be enriched. Dear friends, the Lord Jesus humbled himself, <coughs> becoming a true man. What is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? Thou hast made him a little lower than the angels. The Lord Jesus became what he had never been, but he never stopped to be what he has ever been. He was God. He is God and he will be God, but he became flesh. He became man and he will remain to be a man, the son of man. When the Lord Jesus went back to heaven, he went there as the son of man. And I have already made reference to what Stephen says in Acts chapter 7. I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. It is as if the Lord Jesus, as the true man, stood there in order to receive his servant Stephen. The Incarnation, that is a great mystery. The Word became flesh. God became man. What a mystery. And how grateful, dear friends, can we be that the Lord Jesus did not come in power and might and glory, but that he came as a humble man. And we might ask ourselves the question, if we consider this expression, the Son of Man, the true manhood of Christ, why did He become man? What was the reason why He did so? And there are 
manifold reasons. I would just like to, to remember four reasons why it was necessary or why the Lord Jesus became man. The first is, the first reason is that he wanted to glorify God here on earth. In John 13, verse 31, we read, Now God is glorified, no, sorry, now the Son of Man is glorified, and God is glorified in Him, in the Son of Man. Maybe we are more acquainted with the thought that the Lord Jesus, <coughs> being the Son of God, revealed the Father and glorified Him. Him. And so he did, but also as the Son of Man, as the perfect man on earth. He glorified God. He put on display who God is. If we want to see who God is and He is love and light, let us have a look, let us contemplate, let us consider the life of that perfect man. And of course, the, the ultimate on the cross of Calvary, the Son of Man came to glorify God, to show who God is. That is the first reason why He became flesh, why the Word became flesh, why the Lord Jesus became true man. The second, of course, is that, that His incarnation was necessary in order to accomplish that great redemption work on Calvary's cross. God cannot die, of course not. So God became man, the Lord Jesus became flesh so that he could offer his life a ransom for us. We have this one mediator between God and us, the Lord Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul says in, second, in first, uh, sorry, 2 Timothy 2, no, 1 Timothy 2, verse 5 and 6. Well-known verses. For God is one, and the mediator of God and man one. The man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all. For all that is atonement and not substitution. You have the similar wording in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 10, verse 45. The Son of Man has not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. For many, that is substitution. Mark chapter 10, verse 45. But 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 6. He gave his life a ransom for all. That is atonement. The door is open. All those who want, or everybody is, invite, is invited. But all those who come, they will be saved. The Lord Jesus came in order to die. There is a third reason I would like to mention, and that is that being true man, the Lord Jesus set us a wonderful example. He himself said, learn of me. And considering the man, the true man, the Lord Jesus as man on earth, how he served God, how he walked around, how he moved around, how he acted, how he reacted, how he spoke, how he was silent, how he showed grace and mercy and love. In all this, the Lord Jesus has set us an example. The Apostles Peter speaks of the footsteps that he left. 
we can see the footsteps. When we read the Gospels, when we consider the Lord Jesus as the true man, we see his footsteps and we should follow in these footsteps. That is the third reason why the Lord Jesus became man. And I would like, just like to mention a fourth reason that is in order to be a merciful and sympathizing high priest in heaven now. We read in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15, For we have not a high priest, not able to sympathize with our infirmities, but tempted in all things, in all, sorry, tempted in all things in like manner, sin apart. Yes, the Lord Jesus knows what temptation means. He knows about our difficulties in which we might be here on earth. He is a wonderful, merciful, sympathizing high priest. These are reasons why the Lord Jesus became man. And maybe I may add a fifth reason. I just forgot. It's, I would like to mention five reasons. There is a fifth one. Now he is the Son of Man in heaven. And it is he, as man in heaven, who guarantees our place in the house of his Father. John 14, well-known verses, where the Lord Jesus tells his, his, his disciples that he would go in order to prepare a place. The true man in heaven, our guarantee that one day we will reach that target. Now that is the first part. Thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, the humble son of man, the one who was rich and who became poor, the one who was God and who emptied himself, who humbled himself. But then we have the glory thereafter. Son of Man, as I have already pointed out, is a title of glory. And I would like to read one verse in the Gospel of Luke where the Lord Jesus himself quotes Psalm 8. He says to his enemies, And then, Shall they see, or he speaks about, yeah, shall they about his enemies, and then they shall see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. The one who went to Calvary's cross, who died there, who humbled himself, who became obedient unto the death of the cross. The same Son of Man is the one who will be coming back in power and glory with that crown on his head. No more a, cr a crown of thorns. We had a crown of thor thorns for the Son of Man 2,000 years ago. But then there is no more a, a crown of thorns, but a crown of glory. He will come in a cloud of power and great glory. And we have already quoted from Revelation 14, verse 14, the last reference in the New Testament where the Lord Jesus comes back as the Son of Man in order to judge, first of all, the judgment has been given to him because he is the Son of Man, he will judge first, and then he will rule. In Psalm 110, another great messianic psalm, you get the Lord Jesus, the Son of Man, at the right hand of God. And Psalm 110 begins with that wonderful verse, Jehovah said unto my Lord, sit at my right sight until I put thine enemies as footstool of thy feet. Son of Man, title 
of glory. <coughs> now, I have already said that in the Old Testament you get this expression, son of man, just three times. And all these three references in the Old Testament speak about that title of glory. The first one is Psalm 144. The first one is Psalm 8, by the way, but then Psalm 144, verse 3. Jehovah, what is man that thou takest knowledge of him, the son of man that thou takest thought of him? If you read the whole psalm, we won't do that now. If you read the whole psalm, you will see that here, son of man is in relation to his kingdom over Israel. He will rule over Israel as the son of man. The one they rejected will one day rule over his earthly people. The second reference is in the book of Daniel, chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. I saw in the night visions, that is Daniel, and behold, there came with the clouds of heaven one like a son of man. That is Revelation 14, 14. <coughs> and he came up even to the ancient of days, and they brought him near before him, and there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. This is the eternal kingdom, the millennium, and here the title Son of Man appears in relation to his ruling over the nations. He is not only the king of Israel, he is, but he also is the king, the ruler over all the nations in the millennium. Israel will be blessed, and in Israel all the nations will be blessed. The Lord Jesus will be king of kings, lord of lords, ruling over Israel and over the nations. And then you get thirdly, and then thirdly, you get Psalm 8, and in Psalm 8 it is even more. It's not just people, it's not just Israel, <coughs> it's not just the nations, <coughs> but we have read, Thou hast make, made him to rule over the works of thy hand. Thou hast put everything under his feet. All mankind and all creation, everything under the fate of the Lord Jesus. The things on earth and the things in heaven. You certainly have read about the dreams of Joseph, Genesis 37. Joseph had two dreams. In the first dreams, dream, the sheaves of the field bowed to Joseph. And in the second dream, sun, moon and stars bowed to Joseph. That is a reference to that wonderful dominion of the Lord Jesus over all the things on earth and over all the things in heaven. That is the expression <clears throat> we get in Ephesians chapter 1. We will ref refer to this later again, but I would just like to, to read that. Ephesians chapter 1, there it is about the purpose of God in verse 11. He purposed in himself for the administration of the fullness of times, that is the millennium, the wonderful rule of the Lord Jesus, to head up all things in the Christ, the crowned Christ, the things in the heavens 
and the things upon the earth. I'm sure that Paul makes reference to what we have in Psalm 8. The Lord Jesus will rule over heaven, heavens and over earth. It is interesting to notice that in verse 8, Verse 7, it says, sheep and oxen, all of them, and also the beasts of the field, the fowls of heavens, and the fishes of the sea, whatever passeth through the path of the seas. When you compare this with the dominion of the most powerful earthly rulers, you will mark, remark a difference. When Daniel spoke to King Nebuchadnezzar, he said to him in Daniel 2, Thou, O king, verse 37 and 38, Thou, O king, art a king of kings, not the king of kings, but a king of kings, unto whom the God of heavens has given the kingdom, the power and the strength and the glory, and who so ever the children of man, the beasts of the fields and the fowl of the heavens dwell. He hath given them into thy hand and hath made thee ruler over them all. Did you realize something? There is something, something missing here in this quotation in Daniel 2. Where are the fishes of the sea? The earthly rulers are sometimes very mighty, very powerful. God gave them dominion, but they do not rule over the fishes. But the Lord Jesus, being Son of Man, when He will take the reign, when He will rule, He will also rule over the fishes of the sea and whatever passeth through the paths of the seas. Now this part of Psalm 8 is quoted in the New Testament. And I would like to reread from Hebrews chapter 2 and we read the verses 7 to 9. <clears throat> thou hast made him some little inferior to the angels. Thou hast crowned him with glory and honor and hast set him over all the works of thy hands. And thou hast subjected all things under his feet. For in subjecting all things to him, he has left nothing unsubjected to him. This is already true, but it is not yet visible. But now, we continue reading in Hebrews 2, but now we see him not yet all things, sorry, but now we see not yet all things subjected to him, but we see Jesus, who was made some little inferior to angels on account of the sufferings of death, crowned <coughs> with glory and honor, so that by the grace of God he should taste death for everything. The Lord Jesus already has this place, Psalm 110, uh, 110. He is already sitting at the right hand of God. But his rule, his dominion is not yet public. We see it. We recognize him as the Lord of Lords, as the Son of Man in heaven, the glorified Son of Man. But the day will come when this will also be seen here on earth. Now there is another quotation of this psalm in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and I would like to read that verse, verse 27. Paul says, For he has God, he has put all things in subjection under his feet. But when we, he says that all things are put in subjection, it is evident that it is except him who put all things in subjection to him. 
Now, all things are under his feet, but there are two exceptions. One exception is 1 Corinthians 15, verse 27. That is God himself. Of God, of course. The one who subjected him everything cannot be subjected to him. This is the first exception. But there is a second one. There is a second one. And, dear friends, this is touching our heart now. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 22 and 23 is another reference, if not a quotation, of Psalm 8. And has put all things under his feet. That is Psalm 8. He has put all things under his feet and gave him Christ, the crowned Christ, the Son of Man in heaven. He gave him to be head over all things to the assembly which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Sometimes we tend to think that here Christ is presented as the head of the assembly. But that is not Ephesians 1. You get that in other references, in other scriptures, of course. He is the glorified head of his body. But what Paul wants to say here in Ephesians 1 is that in that character of being head over all things, he has given the assembly, the church, to Christ. His body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Of course, this is not said in Psalm 8. The Old Testament does not speak about the assembly, does not speak about the church. Psalm 8, Psalm 8 tells us the Lord Jesus as Son of Man will rule over all the works of God's hand. But the New Testament tells us that in this character as being head over all the creation, heavens and earth, the assembly Will be, he will be given to the assembly, to be head over all things to the assembly. And then there is another thing that is not mentioned in the Old Testament. It is great to consider the glory of Christ in Psalm 8, but there is something else that is not revealed in the Old Testament. And that is Ephesians 1 again, verse 10 and 12. And I would like to read also these two verses, or three verses. For the administration of the fullness of the times, that is God's purpose in the millennium, to head up all things in the Christ, we have already quoted that verse, the things in the heavens and the things upon earth. And now the Apostle Paul adds something, something very important, hidden in the Old Testament, hid in the Old Testament, in whom we have also obtained an inheritance. Christ will not rule alone. Yes, he is the ruler. The sovereign, he will have dominion and power and glory, but he will not be alone. He is the heir of God, but we are his co-heirs. We will share, no, he will share that <coughs> inheritance with us. When the Lord Jesus comes again in power and glory, his revelation here on earth, he will not be alone. We will be with him. That is pure grace. And that is more than what we get in Psalm 8. But what we have seen in Psalm 8 is already overwhelming us. It is an overpowering thought, isn't it, dear friends? The Lord Jesus, the Son of Man, the one who was a poor man, true man on earth, 
who humbled himself, who was made a little lower than the angels, who went to Calvary's cross, who was crowned with the crown of thorns, who gave his life, he will be the one who will have power and dominion, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. In Hebrews 5, the writer of this epistle says about the Lord Jesus, concerning whom we have much to say. Hebrews 5, verse 11. Concerning whom we have much to say. We have only scrapped a little on the surface tonight. There is more to see, more to say. The glory of the Lord Jesus is great. Also, His glory as the Son of Man, be it the Son of Man, the humble man on earth, be it the glorious King in His kingdom. Thank you for your attention and the Lord bless you.